Across the street was good old Fred Phelps. Fred fucking Phelps. Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Crew Time. Crew, Crew Time. It's Crew Time. Crew Time. If you're new here, hi. <laughs> my name is Sarah, and what I do here is tell you a terrible story to ruin your day and put on my makeup while I do it. So if that sounds good to you, go ahead and subscribe to this channel right now and hit the bell notification, and then that way you will never miss one of my terrible stories. We are continuing our tour of the United States. We're gonna try to hit every one of them. And today's story comes from the least populous state, the state that has only two escalators. It's also the home of Jeffree Star and his 70 acre yak ranch, which Jeffree Star raising yaks for steaks, not on my bingo card. Anyway, we're going to Wyoming. Today's story is a highly recommended one, and it's one that's important to remember in the month of June when we celebrate gay pride here in the United States. So pride isn't about how gay you are, but it is about celebrating the visibility, equality, and dignity of the people of the Alphabet Mafia. LGBTQ and all the other letter people that deserve love and respect and the right to exist without being persecuted. So before we get into that story, I do also wanna let you know that there is a special pride edition of the unsubscribe shirt. <laughs> It's in the merch store. There's also a tank top because it's hot as hell outside. The profits from the sales of these shirts will be donated to the Trevor Project, which is the world's largest crisis intervention organization for LGBT youth. Click the links down in the description box to learn more, and let's get into it. This is the story of Matthew Shepard. Okay, I think it's been a couple of videos since I have said this, but if you wanna know what makeup I'm using because I don't talk about it during the story, it's all in the description box. And there's also a new feature. Um, you might see a little, like a shopping bag icon on the screen. If you click that, it'll show you some of the stuff too. Matthew Wayne Shepard was born on December 1st, 1976 in Casper, Wyoming to Judy and Dennis Shepard. Matt had a younger brother named Logan. Casper is the second largest city in Wyoming and you know it because that's where those two escalators are. I'm not kidding, okay, there's literally two escalators in the entire state of Wyoming. Why can't I get over this? When Matthew was a very young boy, he was fascinated with the mailman and like the concept of mail. <laughs> he thought the neighbors should get like good mail sometimes. So he would write little poems and notes to each neighbor and put them in their mailboxes. Isn't that cute? Eventually his parents had to have a little chat with him and let him know that you're not really allowed to monkey around with the mail. <laughs> so instead he started collecting these like beautiful rocks and he would leave them beside the mailboxes, you know? He was just determined to make people smile. Matthew's childhood nickname was Dandelion Head because he had this like wild blonde hair. Just after his like junior year in high school, his family moved. His dad worked for an oil company. In 1993, they offered his dad a promotion, but it came with a transfer to Saudi Arabia. <laughs> Well, Dennis and Judy were super excited, you know, to bring their kids to the Middle East and show them the world. So they did make the move. The problem was where they were living in Saudi Arabia, there wasn't any English speaking schools for the kids. Matt and Logan decided to study at the American school in Switzerland, which is actually a really, it's a really good school. It's a boarding school. The American school in Switzerland is the acronym TASIS, TASIS. Matthew made friends that he would carry with him long after graduating. He was a really good student and he became fluent in both German and Italian. Matt's friends from school and after described him as somebody who could fit into any occasion, you know? He was that guy who could just walk around a room of people and have no trouble making conversation. In his last year at Tassis, the senior class took a trip to Marrakesh, Morocco. The students said that they wanted to go someplace completely different instead of just, you know, visiting another local country. Kind of like when I was a senior in high school in North Carolina and my senior class took a bus to Florida. Exotic. <laughs> anyway, Matt and his friends traveled to Morocco. They said they felt nervous at first being in a foreign country without protection, but eventually they felt safe and had a good time. One night, Matt decided to go out exploring by himself. And when he came back to the room, his friends opened the door for him. All he could do was scream. They say they never heard a sound like that come from a person ever. Matt had been 
attacked. He was grabbed by a group of six men, dragged into an alley, and then they all took turns raping him. He did make a report of this assault to the police, but I suppose there was just not much they could do, you know. So Matthew's mom later said that after that attack, he was just never quite the same. He had panic attacks, he was hypervigilant, um, he suffered from nightmares. I think Murray's getting in the litter box. Can you hear it? Can you see it? So Matthew was never comfortable in crowds again, which is understandable, you know. He started suffering from severe depression and started using drugs and alcohol and was having suicidal ideations. After his graduation from the high school in Switzerland, Matt came back to the United States. His parents and brother stayed behind in Saudi Arabia, but he did visit, you know, from time to time. In the fall semester of 1995, Matt started taking classes at Catawba College in Salisbury, North Carolina. Unfortunately, you know, the next semester he dropped his classes and he ended up going into inpatient treatment in Raleigh, North Carolina for depression. Well, after Matthew completed the treatment, he was just sort of drifting, you know. He moved back to Wyoming and he enrolled at Casper Community College in 1997 he moved to Denver, Colorado for a brief time. Again, you know, he's just kind of drifting and trying to figure stuff out, you know. While he was in Denver, he did make a friend, an openly gay woman. This woman was very inspirational to him. You know, she was living her life loud and proud, and Matthew was hopeful that maybe he could do that one day. At age 20-ish, Matthew officially came out to his family. They knew, of course. Matthew's family was very supportive and they let him know that they loved him now as much as they ever did. By 1998, he moved back to Wyoming, this time to Laramie, which is a smaller city, um, smaller than where he grew up. It's about two and a half hours south of Casper. Laramie is where the University of Wyoming is, so it's probably like the most progressive area of the state, being a college town. At this time, Matthew enrolled at UW as a political science major and eventually joined several groups at the school. He was even chosen as the student representative for the Wyoming Environmental Council. Matthew became very active in the LGBT alliance and suggested that they set up a mentoring program. His idea, which they still use to this day, was to have a more senior person in the alliance be a mentor to or a sponsor to new kids at school. Kids. These are like young adults. The point was to, you know, show them around and just let them know they're not alone. On October 6th of 1998, the 21-year-old Matthew attended a meeting with the LGBTA to discuss events for Coming Out Day, which was scheduled for October 11th. Okay, so Matthew and friends decided after the meeting to go to the Fireside Lounge in Laramie, which was a gay-friendly bar. Just a week before this, Matt had told his friend Walter Bolden that he felt safe in Laramie, you know, that he could finally relax. Walter would also later say that Matt wasn't somebody who would just like make a pass at a random man in a bar, you know? Yes, Matthew was involved, of course, with LGBT issues at school, but he was still making his way out in public places. So as the evening went on, Matt's friends called it a night and they left, but Matthew stayed behind because he wanted to enjoy a second drink. Then two men around the same age as Matthew approached, Aaron McKinney and Russell Henderson. Russell Henderson was born and raised in Laramie. Russell's home life was not very good in the beginning. His parents fought a lot and eventually they divorced, so he went to go live with his grandma. He actually was a really good student, you know, he did well, and he spent a lot of time in church, and he even was involved in Boy Scouts, becoming an Eagle Scout, which is a big deal. He had a lot of friends, and he seemed to thrive under his grandma's care. But when he turned 17, something switched. You know, it was his senior year of high school, he started skipping classes, he wasn't doing any of his homework, and he wasn't able to graduate on time. He also started smoking marijuana and then doing harder street drugs, you know. And that is how he met Aaron McKinney. Aaron was his drug dealer. So Aaron McKinney's story is somewhat close to that of Russell's. Um, he was also born and raised in Laramie. His parents had a terrible marriage. It was violent and volatile, but Aaron's parents were affluent. You know, they had money. His parents eventually divorced when he was about nine years old, 
And then his mom remarried when he was around 13 and they moved to like the richy rich side of town. In 1993, Aaron's mom was undergoing a routine surgery, but she died on the table, completely unexpected. Because of this, Aaron received a $100,000 insurance payout from medical malpractice, but he didn't do anything useful with it. He bought a car, but the rest of it was just sort of like spent on drugs. It was at this time that he also started selling drugs and earned the nickname Dopey. Okay, so back to the bar. These two guys have just approached Matt. So the bartender at the Fireside Lounge from that night, Matthew Galloway, he testified later that Aaron and Russell were not drunk or out of their minds on drugs. It's something that he watches out for as a bartender so he can be responsible when serving people. He also said that Aaron and Russell approached Matt and then shortly after, the three of them left together. Well, these two shitheads had hatched a plan to rob Matt of his wallet and any money that he had. They said they knew that he'd have money because he was dressed nicely and they could tell that he was gay. I don't know how that means that you're gonna have money, but okay. Well, these two put on their best, like, gay act, and they chatted up Matthew and offered him a ride home. Once they had Matthew in Aaron's truck, they started beating him. Russell also had a 357 Magnum with him um, that he later claimed they were just trying to sell that night. Aaron, as a convicted felon, didn't want to get caught with a gun. What he didn't tell police was that you know, somebody had used that gun as payment for drugs about a month ago. Okay, so in the truck, they tell Matt that they're lying, you know, they're not gay, and they're gonna jack him up. Matt gave up his wallet very quickly and offered whatever money he had back at his apartment so long as they wouldn't hurt him. Well, continue to hurt him. So Russell drove them out past the expensive Sherman Hill Estates, and they ended up in a mostly empty field. They took Matt out of the truck and then Aaron hit him in the head over and over and over with the butt of the gun and his fists. Then with rope from the back of the truck, Russell tied Matt's hands together behind him and then they tied him to the post of a buck fence. Once Aaron was done beating him, they stole his shoes and left him there tied to the fence in the freezing cold night. So Aaron and Russell then went back to town. Aaron said that they were trying to sell that gun. Russell said that they were looking for Matt's apartment to rob. Either way, what they found was trouble. So they went to the area of Matt's apartment and they saw two other shitheads going up and down the street slashing people's tires. Well, they didn't like that and they confronted them and then they started fighting and then the next thing you know, somebody's called the police to report a disturbance. Side note, this story, it just makes it sound like Laramie is a dangerous place and it just isn't. It was a busy night, I guess. Okay, so in this fight was Jeremy Herrera and his friend Emiliano Morales and of course Aaron and Russell. So this was just a fist fight at first, but then Aaron grabbed that gun that he had just beat the shit out of Matt with and he started striking Emiliano in the head with it as well. Well, the police did respond. They showed up. Everybody ran. They scattered like roaches but they did capture Russell. They identified the truck that he was driving. They saw a credit card on the dash with the name Matthew Shepard, which at this point didn't mean anything to them yet. At around 3 a.m., Russell was cited for interfering with the police, but then he was released. Aaron evaded capture and he ended up climbing through the window of his house. I guess he didn't have the keys to the door. I don't know, whatever. By this time, it's about 1.30 a.m. He's covered in blood, and he told his girlfriend that he and Russell killed someone. She later said that she didn't believe him, you know. Okay, so later that same day, way later, in like the late afternoon around 5 p.m., Aaron went to the Ivinson Memorial Hospital suffering from a head injury from that night with the fights and all that and he was admitted for treatment. So 18 hours after the attack on Matthew out in that field, it was about 6 p.m. Wednesday, October 7th, Aaron Kreifels was out um, going on a bike ride and he went ass over tea kettle. <laughs> Poor thing. Well, when he got up to dust himself off, he saw what he thought looked like a scarecrow tied to a fence. 
Now remember, it's October, so in his mind, he thought it was like maybe a Halloween prop. And I mean, it had to be because it was like covered in blood. But when he got closer, he realized that it was a person and this person was still alive. So he ran to the nearest house and called 911. The first responder was from the sheriff's department, um, Deputy Reggie Flutie. She said when she arrived and she saw Matt, he was so small, she thought it was a child. So Matt had a very small frame. He was just, just a small person. He was about 5'1 and weighed like 100 pounds. Well, she tried her best to free him, but that rope was so tight that she couldn't at first. She had rolled him onto a side for a moment to, you know, for better access and he had stopped breathing. So she hurried up and put him back, you know. She eventually did get the rope cut and she said that Matthew's whole face was covered in blood, just covered. The only place that he didn't have any blood on him on his face was what appeared to be where he'd been crying down his face. When Matthew arrived at Ivinson Memorial Hospital, they knew right away that they were not equipped to help him. So he was very quickly life flighted to Powdre Valley Hospital. It's a level three trauma facility in Fort Collins, Colorado. When Matthew arrived, he had to be put on a ventilator because he could no longer breathe on his own. So he had suffered at least 20 blows to his head and face. And he had four separate skull fractures. The final blow that caused maybe the most damage came down just behind his right ear and it crushed his skull and brainstem and it took part of his ear off. None of it made any sense to us. The degree of violence was just, it was, it was horrific. Um, later we came to understand that when it's a hate crime, this is a definite signal of a hate crime, that level of, of violence. So because of this injury to his brainstem, they couldn't do surgery at all, even though he desperately needed it. So Matthew was on life support and his parents were notified. Remember, they live in Saudi Arabia at this time. They took the very next flight that they could get, and it took them about 21 hours to get there. When they arrived, they were just shocked at what they found. Judy said that his face was so swollen. He was just unrecognizable. She had to get up so close to be able to tell. It was like he didn't even look like Matt. He had stitches all over his face, and he was swollen, and bandages all over his head. and but she could, she knew her child. I mean, all this for what? The, the $20 that he had in his wallet? So while Matt was in this coma, the story started to spread and the whole world was watching. Initially, the local news stations were carrying the story, but then overnight it had gone national. It just spread like wildfire. I think I say that every time. <laughs> It's true. There were candlelight vigils held in cities all around the world, and there was even one held in front of the White House. Well, because of all that ruckus with the, uh, the street fight and all that stuff, it did not take police long at all to like put the pieces together, you know? And pretty quickly, by Thursday, October 8th, Russell, Aaron, and their girlfriends were all arrested. The girlfriends were arrested because they were trying to give false alibis for both of the men. Well, they also said that they didn't really know much about the actual crime, but they did know where some evidence was. Well, with that information, the sheriffs were able to get a search warrant for Aaron and Kristen's house. And in that search, they recovered Matthew's wallet, his driver's license, and Aaron's bloody clothes, bloody with Matthew's blood. Remember, Aaron was in the hospital for those head injuries, but once he was released, he was arrested, of course, and confessed. That confession granted them a search warrant for his truck, and that's where they found Matthew's shoes, his credit card, and that bloody gun. I mean, all of this really happened pretty quickly because these shitbirds didn't even bother to like try to hide anything at all. There were tire prints for the truck, there were footprints, Matthew's belongings in the house and the truck, um, just so much evidence. They were charged with three counts of kidnapping, aggravated robbery, and attempted first-degree murder. Now, most of this, with the exception of arresting Aaron, had already happened by the time that Judy and Dennis arrived at the hospital. Also, they refused to do any interviews and they wanted nothing to do with all of this press that was surrounding the attack of their son. When the Shepard family arrived at Fort Collins on October 9th, around noon, they were given the 
heartbreaking news that Matthew would never recover. They informed the doctors that Matthew was an organ donor and they wanted to honor those wishes, but this is when they found out that Matthew was HIV positive, so they couldn't donate the organs. So Judy and Dennis sat with Matthew at his bedside and they did the best they could to accommodate his friends who wanted to come see him one last time. We played his favorite music. We uh, sprayed his cologne around the room. His brain was injured so badly that his body could no longer feel pain. He couldn't regulate his body temperature, he couldn't breathe, nothing. President Bill Clinton, the president at the time, actually contacted the Shepherds. They were very adamant that their son not be made some kind of political tool, you know. They weren't fans of Slick Willie in the first place. President Clinton was very sincere and he told them that he just wanted them to have his support and condolences. On October 10th, the University of Wyoming had their homecoming parade and they included a special banner to fly at the end. It was a yellow banner with three green circles, which was meant to be a symbol of peace. It was created by the university's multicultural center. About 500 people spontaneously marched behind the banner in honor of Matthew. Also, at the football game, the players had the three green circles on their helmets. At the homecoming football game, 15,000 people stood in silence for Matthew Shepard. On Monday, October 12, 1998, Matthew Shepard died in the hospital. Um, he was able to remove from them the guilt or stress of having to make that decision. They said that uh, he came into the world premature and he left the world premature. They were most grateful for the time that they had to spend. So flags were flown at half staff at the University of Wyoming. The Gay Awareness Week events began. The Casper, Wyoming City Council held a special session to pass an ordinance to ban demonstrations on public property within 50 feet of a funeral service. And they did this in anticipation of what was to come, the Westboro Baptist Church. On Friday, October 16, 1998, Matthew's funeral was held at St. Mark's Episcopal Church in Casper, where he grew up. Over 1,000 people gathered to grieve for Matthew. Well then, across the street was good old Fred Phelps. Fred fucking Phelps. If you're not aware of who Fred Phelps is, I'll include up here in the eye a video to a, a really great channel called Fundy Fridays that covers stuff like this. Westboro Baptist Church, church, they're from Kansas and they really like to protest and they're just really inflammatory and hateful and just fucking gross, man. They go to the funerals of gay people or people with AIDS, which is not always the same thing. Anyways, um, they hold up these terrible signs about how you're gonna burn in hell and you deserve to die and just, ugh, it's terrible. Anyway, they're, they're just straight assholes. Hi, Murray, I know. I know. What? Yeah? What else? Murray has something to say. The two men were looking at either life without parole or the death penalty. You know, those are the only options. Okay, so very early on, Russell Henderson took a plea deal. Well, I guess Russell didn't want to take his chances, so he pled out. He pled guilty to first degree felony murder and was sentenced to two life sentences uh, with no possibility of parole. When Aaron McKinley's trial started, those Westboro Baptist clowns returned. Well, the people of Laramie were not having it. So a group of citizens from Laramie actually dressed up in like these angel costumes, white outfits, right? And they circled around the protesters and when they raised their arms, like the wings, it looked like wings, it would kind of block them out and their hateful signs. So Aaron McKinney had been charged with first degree felony murder, second degree murder, aggravated robbery, and kidnapping. And this piece of shit when he was in jail was like bragging about what he had done. But you know, as soon as that death penalty came knocking, he tucked tail and started conjuring up like elaborate justifications for what happened. So he tried to use the gay panic defense. Basically, that's when a straight person gets hit on by a gay person and it freaks them out so bad that they're like temporarily insane and not responsible for having a violent reaction. Stupid. Can you believe that's a legitimate legal strategy? <laughs> Anyways, well, the judge said that that's ridiculous. They didn't meet the threshold of proof, so he wouldn't allow it to come in as a defense. Well, then they pivoted, saying that 
you know, Russell was so high that he had no idea what was going on. I mean, the problem with that though is that he had already like confessed <laughs> and his confession matched Aaron's confession. The confession being that they targeted Matthew because he was gay and they thought he was going to be an easy mark, you know? Aaron McKinney was found guilty and he got the same sentence as the other asswipe, two life sentences without parole to be served consecutively. At the sentencing, Dennis Shepard said in his victim impact statement, quote, I would like nothing better than to see you die, Mr. McKinney, but now is the time to heal. Every time you wake up in your cell, remember that you had the opportunity or the ability to stop your actions that night. I do not like these lashes, but this is where we are. The two girlfriends, remember they were involved because they are liar liar pants is on fire. Pants? Anyway, Chastity Pasley, Russell Henderson's girlfriend, was found guilty of accessory after the fact to first degree murder, and she was sentenced to 15 months um, to two years in prison. Good, shithead. Kristen Price, Aaron McKinney's girlfriend, cooperated with police and helped the prosecution, so her charges were lowered to only a misdemeanor for interfering with a police officer, and she pled guilty to that. She was sentenced to 180 days, but much of it was suspended since she cooperated with the state's case. For many years after their son's brutal murder, Dennis and Judy worked on passing legislation concerning hate crimes. Up until this point, the hate crimes legislation didn't cover gay people. My neighbor is sawing something, it sounds like. <laughs> Fucking great. Dennis and Judy started the Matthew Shepard Foundation, which according to their website, the foundation's mission is to amplify the story of Matthew Shepard to inspire individuals, organizations, and communities to embrace the dignity and equality of all people. On October 28, 2009, President Barack Obama signed into law the Matthew Shepard James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act. The law extends to crimes motivated by actual or perceived race, color, religion, national origin, disability, gender, or sexual orientation. So in addition to an actual criminal act, the motivation is a separate and additional crime. Because no one in America should ever be afraid to walk down the street holding the hands of the person they love. Now at root, this isn't just about our laws, this is about who we are as a people. Well, some people have a different viewpoint of the Matthew Shepard story, and it's because of a book that was released in 2013. A journalist named Steven Jimenez published a book, right, about Matthew's murder called The Book of Matt. How many times am I gonna say book? Um, his research was also featured in a story that aired on 2020. But anyways, in the book, he theorizes that Matt was no angel and insinuated that he was enmeshed in like the local meth scene, addicted to drugs and prostituted himself to pay his bills. Well, Steven Jimenez wrote that Aaron and Russell, what they did was not a hate crime. And he says, in fact, that Aaron and Matt had a sexual relationship, that this was a drug deal gone wrong. They were all high on meth, all of them, and things just got out of hand. Rob Debris, the lead investigator on the case, commented that the book contained many factual errors, lies, and the idea that Matthew Shepard was some kind of methamphetamine kingpin was laughable. There was a gag order on this case for many years, so a lot of time went by before any investigators or law enforcement people were able to speak publicly about it. The general consensus is that Aaron and Russell were looking for somebody to rob and the confrontation escalated to murder because of their latent homophobia and hate. In other words, they viewed Matthew as an easy target and definitely intended to rob him, but if he hadn't been gay, they wouldn't have killed him. Now, while some people still believe the bullshit theory, it was proven wrong by the killers themselves in their original interrogations. And then later in an interview with Elizabeth Vargas from 2020, they were very consistent saying that they didn't know Matthew. They didn't have drugs to sell them. And at this point, they're in prison for the rest of their lives. So like, what, what reason do they have to lie? If it was about the drugs, they could have and would have used that excuse way earlier. In 2018, Judy and Dennis were offered another path toward peace. Back when they had Matt's funeral in 1998, they had his body cremated because they were afraid that any cemetery that they chose 
would be vandalized. Well, the shepherds reached out to their longtime friend, the Right Reverend Gene Robinson, the first openly gay man to ever be elected as a bishop in the Episcopal Church. In 2013, he resigned his position as Bishop of New Hampshire and moved to Washington, D.C., and he began working as a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress and was also a bishop in residence at St. Thomas's Parish. The Shepherd family was seeking full closure over their son's murder, and they requested to have have Matthew's ashes interred at the Cathedral Church of St. Peter and St. Paul, also known as Washington National Cathedral. The request was readily accepted. On October 26, 2018, a public remembrance for Matthew Shepard was held at National Cathedral. It was absolutely a full house and it holds 4,000 people. Uh, this is the church that you see on TV for state funerals, most recently President George H.W. Bush. Ever heard of him? A private ceremony was held afterwards to inter his remains in the crypt. Some of the other people that are interred there are President Woodrow Wilson and Helen Keller. It's not only that Matthew Shepard's remains are in the company of famous people, <laughs> it's that the Episcopal Church recognizes all people as welcome and worthy. This will be the part where I cry. So I have three things I want to say to Matt. <laughs> Gently rest in this place. You are safe now. Oh yeah, and Matt, welcome home. Amen. The Matthew Shepard Foundation is still in operation today. They work tirelessly to eliminate hate crimes and ensure the safety, visibility, and inclusiveness for the entire LGBT community. Their hope is that one day they'll reach that goal and be able to close their doors. Hopefully they won't have to exist anymore. That, friends, is the story of Matthew Shepard. <coughs> Check the links down in the description box for more information about the Matthew Shepard Foundation. Also remember to pick up your special Pride Edition unsubscribe t-shirt and the sales will go directly to the Trevor Project. You can also donate directly if you prefer. Thank you so much for hanging out today and for watching this video. I really appreciate it. If you want to see more videos like this one, then consider subscribing to this channel before you leave today. I upload new videos here on YouTube every week and you can follow me on the other socials also. That is it for now. I will catch you next time in the next video. Bye. Box to learn, fuck. Hello, Bishop in the Episcopal Church. Why can't I say Episcopal? Somebody is doing construction right now. How dare they? Slash is fucking whack, man. You probably can't even hear what I'm hearing, but it sounds terrible. <clears throat> what am I doing? What am I doing? In two thigh. <laughs> These lashes are kind of whack, man. Wiggity whack. Ew. Ew. Trevor Pro. <laughs>